Harold Lloyd rides again. Yes, the horn-rimmed, straw-hatted hero of a thousand narrow escapes and a million belly laughs is back on the screen in a fast-moving, fun-filled, two-hour free-for-all. Harold Lloyd's World of Comedy. Now, a whole new generation of comedy lovers can thrill to the hilarious, hair-raising escapades of Harold Lloyd, the acknowledged master of timeless, ageless humor. Harold Lloyd's World of Comedy, where anything can happen, and does. Unlike anything seen on the screen before or since. Comedy highlights down through the years. A veritable treasure house of memorable moments as Harold Lloyd performs the riotous antics that made him an undisputed king of comedy. Harold Lloyd's world of comedy. A world of laughter and romance. Now, no one can look in. We are alone. Oh, but I thought the way you talked to me, I was the woman of your dreams. Oh, no. <laughs> Not my dreams. <laughs> a world of excitement, thrills, and hearty laughter for everyone to enjoy. Warm and wonderful, wild and wacky, this is the one to see. Harold Lloyd's World of Comedy. It's funny. Hey, Harold, would you say something for us? Hola, mis buenas, amigo. That's Spanish. <laughs> you know, since this uh, La Fiesta de la... No, that's empty. I, I was tired. Harold, will you say something for us? Sure. <laughs> Hola, mis uh, buenas, amigos. That's Spanish. <laughs> you see, since this La Fiesta started, everybody's doing it. <laughs> uh, that's my speech. I'm supposed to tell what it's all about here. Wait, I'll try it. Uh, tonight, my friends, this celebration of the 150th anniversary of the founding of the city of Los Angeles is being brought to a brilliant climax. With the Parade of Jewels by, uh, staged by the... Uh, uh, Motion picture industry. <laughs> and boy, it's key. Well, here we go. Adios. That's Spanish, too. <laughs> hey, Harold, say something for us, will you? Sure. <laughs> Hola, mis buenas, amigo. That's Spanish. Uh, you see, uh, since this uh, La Fiesta de Los Angeles started, everybody's talking. Just a moment. That's my speech. <laughs> I'm uh, supposed to explain what's happening here tonight. I'll give it. Uh, tonight, my friends, this celebration of the 150th anniversary uh, of the founding of the City of Angels is being brought to a brilliant climax with the Parade of Jewels, staged by the... Uh, Motion picture industry. And boy, it's key. Yes, sir. Okay, now we're gonna go. So long. Adios. <laughs> That's Spanish, too. I remember a few years ago taking a pair of glasses and creating what we call the glass character. Now, among the many pictures that we produced with this character, there are some that seem to have a spirit that ignores the time barrier. I believe that the picture that we're going to show now is one of these. Of course, it was made long before many of you were born before pictures begin to talk. It uh, was in an era that we affectionately called the Roaring Twenties. It was the time of the Model T, and the Flapper, and the Charleston. 
prohibition of alcoholic beverages was the law of the land. And of course, getting around it was a national pastime. There have been lots of changes since then. But there's one thing that hasn't changed, and that's the spirit of youth. It's hopes, it's humor, and it's unfailing courage. And it's to that spirit that we dedicate this picture. It should be an evening of nostalgia, of time past. And uh, this is a past that does not need to apologize to the present. And so to evoke Hera Lloyd, two of a younger generation of comedians, both of them friends, admirers, and uh, pretty wonderful in their own right, Steve Allen and uh, Jack Lemmon. Now, joining them... <clears throat> joining them as a distinguished director who was once, early in his own career, a comedy writer for Harold Lloyd, Delmer Gr uh, Daves. And now, Harold Lloyd, won't you join your inquisitors? We're going to fire a few questions at you that I think will be of interest to all of us. Shouldn't I know they we certainly will be to me when this comes on. There shouldn't we, we sing a song first, lined up like one, this? two, three, four? Da -da -da -da. Harold, a lot of us know, because it says so here, that you were very stage struck as a boy, and that you actually began to appear professionally at about the age of twelve. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, Jack. Well, did this experience, when you were this young, and subsequent experience in the theater, lead? to your motion picture career? Well, yes, uh, I think it did. Uh, my father and I had quite a little experience. We were living in Omaha, and he had been in an accident, inherited about $5,000, which was a fortune to us. And he knew I, uh, this was, of course, a little later, uh, wanted to go into the theater. So we either were going to go to New York or to California, where I could go into stock company. We flipped a coin and we abided by it. It said California. Mm -hmm. That's how I got in the movies. Uh -huh. <laughs> Good point. Harold, did your early experiences in Omaha and your early work as an extra um, have any effect or come in handy in any way when once your actual motion picture career began? Well, Steve, uh, uh, the picture situation started in California, uh, in, uh, in the Midwest, in in Omaha, uh, I played on the stage. At 12, I played the part of Little Abram in uh, Tess of the D'Urbervilles, and in Nell Gwynn, several other stage plays. And I did everything that you could think of, from Call Boy in a Burlesque Show, and Usher, and Candy Butcher, etc. I think they did come in handy, yes. I do, Steve. And Harold, what about your experience with Max Sennett? Did that uh, shape the whole beginning of your major career? Well, you see, I'm not really a... Uh, uh, wasn't really a Max Sennett man. I was a Hal Roach man. Mm -hmm. Hal Roach and I started in uh, really together. We were extras together, and he got a little money too. That seems to be my uh, my lot is somebody getting a little money and kind of I trail along with him. Anyway, <laughs> I worked with Roach first for many many years, and then after that I did. Uh, I had a little argument uh, with Hal uh, because he. Uh, he had another, we were doing two things. We were doing a two-reel uh, drama and a one-reel comedy. And while I was playing the lead in the one-reel comedy, and Roy Stewart was playing the, uh, in the drama, he was paying him $10 a day and me only $5 a day. <laughs> so I thought I was important as Roy, and so uh, I said to him, I gotta have $10 a day. He said, but Harold, we can't afford it. I said, but you're paying Roy? Well, he says, he won't work for any less. So I quit, too. <laughs> oh, that's and that's how I went to send it. I wasn't there too long, though, but I was a Keystone cop in one picture. I worked many times with Ford, Ster uh, Ford uh, Sterling, and uh, Ford had a rubber plot 
always stealing the jewels, and I was the young boy that always got into trouble. But it was, a, it, both lots were wonderful, great training, marvelous experience, and wonderful memories. Well, how was the, uh, when did the Lonesome Luke character start? Where did he come from? Where did he go? Well, the first uh, one that we made uh, was a screwball character I called, called Just Nuts. <laughs> and uh, then we came along to another character, and I uh, had wide shoulders and a little cat mustache and long Prince Albert coat, and we called that Willie Work. Then we finally, <laughs> finally got a character that we called Lonesome Luke, and that was really a, a kind of a half-shoot imitation of Chaplin. Although I tried to be different, I put on tight clothes, where Charlie had loose ones, and I s divided my mustache. Uh -huh. And that went on for a long time. But I was never happy with Luke, because I knew I wasn't getting anywhere. And I finally got this idea for the glasses. It, the, the idea, you could think of, the, of a person wearing glasses as being an erudite, studious person. But uh, you didn't have to be that way. Therefore, it belied your appearance. But they were making so much money on Luke, which he was doing very well, that they wouldn't let me change. So there again, I had to quit about a year later in order to do uh, the one with the glasses. But Luke went on for many, many years and uh, was quite successful, but not really good. <laughs> uh, speaking of glasses, uh, Harold, they seem to be very important here this evening. I noticed Gregory Peck got a hand just for taking his off. <laughs> Miss Swanson got a hand for putting hers on. <laughs> and uh, as I say, we are quite interested in the glasses because I suppose you were the first one in the history of the entertainment uh, profession to become identified closely with them. Uh, was that a sudden decision on your part or did that particular character, which we all know now as the Hair Lord character, did it grow over a long period of time or just how did it start? No, I tell you, I saw uh, what was a feature picture in those days was two reels. And the main character was uh, a minister, and he wore glasses. He didn't wear horn rim glasses, but he wore glasses. But he was a go-getter. He belied his appearance, and that gave me an idea that it would make a good character for me. See, in those days, we had to have trademarks, either a mustache, a chin piece, sideburns. You had to be fat or cockeyed or something of that kind. <laughs> so the glasses also was a trademark for me, but it gave me an idea. It also allowed me to wear normal clothes, and the romances were believable, because uh, now when I got the girl, you could believe it. Before, you had to be the losing lover, believe me, and, uh, or else the girl had to be just as screwy as yourself. <laughs> but uh, this was a, was a great character, but uh, from a standpoint of a change for me. And it wasn't until I did this character that I kind of felt that I was loosened of shackles and I could do what I wanted, Steve. You know, you're talking about taking these glasses off. I read something, I got to take them off too. Can't see a damn thing up close to <laughs> But I, uh, to see all these wonderful friends, I do have to keep them on, Steve. Uh, Harold, we've been friends many, many years, but some of these things I didn't know till now. And one of them, I'm sure everybody will be interested in, is knowing, uh, did the glasses character start as a one-reeler character, or did he grow into uh, two reelers, or how, did, how, how long did you do? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Dell, uh, <laughs> Roach finally, uh, uh, he didn't understand exactly what I wanted in this character. I don't think anybody else did. So he, uh, he had another actor, Toto, the very famous clown. He used to be so great in the Hippodrome. So he was coming out. He put him under contract. So Roach took over Toto and dumped my character into my lap. And at first, I had to write it and, and uh, act it and direct it for about the first three. Uh, what was just the question you wanted to know, Dale? Were, were they all one-reelers, the, free, the oh, first glasses characters? I hear you, yes. Well, I was doing two real Lukes, uh, Lonesome Lukes at the time, and when we started this, I said, no, I wanted to do one-reelers. And they said, for heaven's sakes, what do you want to go backwards for? You, you've worked yourself up to two-reelers. Now, don't you want it? And I said, no, because one-reelers we can make and have come out once a week. Then if we make some bad ones, the others will come fast enough to cover them up. And it was a good policy. Believe me, it worked out. They took but your idea and called it television, Harold. <laughs> <laughs> it's been doing all right, though. <laughs> Harold, uh, excuse me. Uh, apropos of this, now, we had the yeah. one-reelers and the two-reelers, and they were immensely successful, and you just gave a very good reason for... You're not doing bad either, uh, Hello, operator's a bad <laughs> connection here. But, uh, 
since the grosses and the success and everything else was so wonderful, why then did you go on into uh, taking the risk of feature length films at that time? Was it because the business itself was going that way or was it your own decision? No, we didn't. Uh, ours was an evolution, it just grew. Uh, the first feature picture, close to feature that I did, was a picture called Sailor Made Man. And it was supposed to be a two-reader. Mm. We started as a two-reader and it just kept growing and it finally, we, uh, it was a little over four reels and we couldn't figure a way to cut it down, so we said, what the hell, it's gonna be a four-reeler. <laughs> now, the next one that I made after that, we thought that we better uh, hold to our other formula and go back to uh, two-reelers again. So we started one that we called Grandma's Boy. And it was probably the best idea that I ever had for a picture. And it also kept growing. And finally, when it got to past the five-reel mark, we just figured a way to quit, and that was the first feature. Mm -hmm. But we didn't start it as a feature, it just happened. And, and the then on, we made features from that time on. And the success of that one, in other yes, words, because it made so way. much more money, we said, what the hell, we can't go back now. <laughs> <laughs> Errol, I don't know if this question will uh, uh, help to evoke you, or <laughs> just what it will do, but I'm sure we'd all be very interested in your response to it. Uh, as compared to the work of uh, some of the early uh, comedy, the other early comedy uh, pioneers, uh, Charles Chaplin, uh, Buster Keaton, Harry Langdon. Uh, do you see uh, what the differences or, or, uh, or similarities do you see in your uh, early characters to their work, if any? Uh, there was certain, uh, we all used uh, gags that had a certain basic quality, but uh, Chaplin and I have been bracketed on the same program many times, and that is the best way to see uh, an entirely different approach that Charles had from what I had. Mm -hmm. They're entirely different. Uh, although, uh, as I say, we all more or less occasionally borrowed gags from each other, and, but we gave them entirely different twists, and our, our method of procedure was entirely different. Uh, no, I think, and I think Buster was just as different from, from Charlie. Uh, later on, uh, Laurel and Hardy, they came a little afterwards. Theirs was entirely different. But uh, there was a, a similarity in, uh, in the idea that uh, the story was secondary and the business, the comedy business, was the main objective. Although, as we got on and did features, then the story became quite paramount to us. Also, as you've already indicated, your character was much more realistic as it eventually evolved than theirs. Yes, I, uh, I think that of the group that we're mentioning, uh, mine was purely because I could wear normal clothes and be believed in my m romances. Uh, Harold, since I worked with you on your last uh, complete film, I think, and since I know the answer to this question, I'm only asking it for your friends here present, and that has to do with uh, what did you contribute in the... By the way, folks, I got credit for writing this story, but this, he's going to answer what really happened. Uh, what was your contribution toward the building of these stories that, uh, that appeared? Well, Dell, in the early days, we used to have a great many, we called them gag men. They were idea men. And they, it, heaven help if you had to think of all your own business. And in the early days, we'd have what we called the gag room. And these men were really specialists. Those days, they got as much as 500 or six or 700 dollars a week. That's pretty good money in those early days. Not bad now, uh, but uh, we'd have this room and uh, they'd, I'd have them work in pairs or, uh, or work by themselves or in groups. Of course, as I say, I was with Hal Roach and Hal was a, was a tremendous idea man himself. And one of the things that uh, in the early days that I got along with Hal was that uh, uh, we, we were very harmonious as that Hal could get very original ideas and he always gave me credit for being able to carry them out properly. But uh, as we went on, the boys would throw their ideas at me and it was up to me to pick and choose, to get the wheat out from the chaff and, uh, and to select it, know what we're gonna have, to pick an idea that one boy had here and put uh, a different interpretation to it or to tell the rest, of the rest of the group to go ahead now and see if we can't build this and put it into a routine. But uh, it was really done. Of course, when you came along, Dell, we were into uh, a little different situation. We were doing uh, dialogue then, mm -hmm. and uh, 
we needed a real writer, and you really were, and we were awfully happy to have you. Did that answer your question or not? Yes, I think that uh, did it. I, w I would like to add a footnote. Uh, Harold in the, is too modest. There was never a scene or a page or even a line of dialogue that he didn't have a very active part in. That's the way this, the, nobody knew Harold Lloyd better than Harold Lloyd. And everything that we wrote for him was constructed as a, as a friendship uh, basis, not even a collaboration. It was a magnificent feeling of, of great friendship always hanging over uh, Harold's studio. Uh, so much so that every girl, I'll just interpolate this little thing, whoever worked with Harold got married immediately yes. afterwards. This That's is a right. curious really? thing. Yeah. Uh, not to me, not to me. No, not no to it's... Uh, not because it was necessary, I hope. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> you can go home now, Steve. He's dismissed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a, this, this curious factor gradually uh, developed, and he has an alumni, uh, what he might call his Cupid alumni, and I belong in that group because I met my blessed wife uh, on a Harold Lloyd picture, and he is our Cupid. Sure and, was. Uh, that was 25 years ago, and she's sitting right down here tonight. Yes, I think I was greatly responsible for, <laughs> for playing that. Of course, I married one of the leading ladies, so I held up the tradition there. Uh, <laughs> Another thing uh, that, Dell, that remember, at that point, I was financing my own pictures. And it behooved me, believe me, to get in there and see that it, I was going to try to get my money back. <laughs> Dell, I think this is where we're going to film. No, no, no. Oh, oh yes. Uh, uh, no, I think, that, uh, I think that the next one is uh, uh, number three. I think that belongs to you, Jack. It does? Yeah. Harold, you're in great trouble, because I'm going to talk about a film we haven't seen yet. I hear you. I think. No, we're... Are we going go to ahead. show the film? Uh, I believe. The, the next... Uh, well, at any rate, it, uh, if you're... <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, this... Uh, Just a this minute. He's right. Wait a minute. Well, holler well, the rest of the way. It's a good backdrop. I back up to the quiet scrotted here. No, leave it there. I'm very sorry. I thought this was where the film was run with the screen scrotted. Time will save time. <laughs> uh, Harold... <laughs> What to you is the significance of the glasses? In other words, in its relationship to the whole, or the whole brash and yet shy character that you created? Well, uh, sort of an introvert, uh, uh, but I didn't really hold to that because I changed uh, the attitude of my character in, in practically every different picture. One time, not only was he a poor boy one time or a rich boy another time, but his whole thinking attitude was different. One time he could be an introvert, he could be just a normal uh, boy, he could be very shy, or he could be exceedingly brash. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a picture that we, I put out, uh, with a lot of a composite type of picture, uh, I put in different types of uh, sequences where he was just that. But the glasses that you ask about was really the crux of it because I think I mentioned a little while ago, it, uh, uh, he looks studious, but he doesn't necessarily have to be studious. Mm. And it was, in the early days, a uh, complete trademark. It was my mustache or chin piece. So that when they didn't know my name, which in many places in Europe, they, uh, they could say the fellow with the glasses. In fact, one day at a polo match, it was played here between Argentine and our team, and they took me around to the whole group and introduced me as Harold Lloyd, and they were formal and polite and said hello and so forth and went on talking. Finally, somebody recognized me and said, you're Del Gadillo. And I said, I am? And so he said, yes, and he started to laugh and took me all around and introduced me again as Del Gadillo, and I was a big success then. <laughs> but the glasses did that. Harold, you, uh, we were speaking a few minutes ago about the fact that your character was uh, the most realistic uh, of, of the comedy characters of its day. And uh, now you've just pointed out a certain inconsistency uh, in, terms of, of <laughs> in terms of the character from one picture to the next. And it just has occurred to me that that may be one of the explanations for the popularity of your character. And that may have indicated uh, that it was even more realistic because man is an inconsistent creature. 
And therefore, I think, uh, I don't want to get too philosophical here. You have point, though, Steve. But I, I, I think uh, people were able to sort of grow with the character. The character was able to grow with the public. And that's why it was uh, so well loved and so enjoyed over the years. Why don't we see pictures of that sort anymore? Uh, do you think it's simply the, since the addition of sound we can't go back? Or do you think it has something to do with the times we live in? No, I think it's a certain progress that carries on when dialogue came in. I remember uh, uh, MGM didn't have equipment, didn't have uh, means to, to produce a talking picture. So they had to go over to Paramount. And they only had a small studio over there. And uh, of course, they didn't know the technique. And it was very difficult to put action into at that time. So uh, when they advertised uh, an all talking picture, <laughs> it was damn well that. They didn't do anything but talk, no action in it. <laughs> and, uh, and so I think that that's uh, where it changed a certain style that we had. Uh, they put it down to pantomime, but we really had lots of action. We depended upon, upon action and the different uh, little pieces of business we did. And then later on, uh, most of the, of the humor came from the verbal. Possibly, this also just hit me, the influence of radio. Radio comedy was about the biggest yes, thing. Yes, that's right. It was obviously entirely verbal. I think it must have influenced pictures, too. Yes, it did. It had a, had a great influence. Of course, they came afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm speaking, was pre-radio, of mm -hmm. course. And, but I think that it, it, uh, it uh, was the trend then. Now, of course, uh, they are getting back a little more, quite a bit more, a number of the boys to, to doing uh, visual business. You do it. You do a great deal of it. And, of course, Jack, who I think is one of the finest comedians that I know of the present day. But, of course, you can't just say Jack's a comedian. He's a, he's a tragedian as well. He just dives back and forth either way. That's and, about uh, it, diving. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Somebody got the brilliant idea. I needed, like, a hole in my head to do a life story of mine. And they said, what about... Uh, who would you like to have in it? And right off the reel, I said, if you can get Jack Lemon, he's the man for me. <laughs> Thank you. Carry on, Jack. <laughs> and Steve here. Well, I'm Benny Goodman. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I can't I be everybody his, here, and I'm sorry. I was on his program just recently. <laughs> he is everybody. Boy, you watch his program. He is everybody on it. And, of course, I can't say any more about this fellow. I've loved him for years, and he helped me out many, uh, many times. Harold, we're going to uh, thank you. You're a loved guy yourself, and you know it. We're going to run uh, uh, the chase sequence from Girl Shy. And it might uh, be interesting to the audience here to know uh, how you built up to the moment of that chase uh, in, the t in the telling of, the, uh, of your story. What led to this chase? I think it, it would give them a little preliminary All right. and be of interest. Well, this was a story. Of course, in this chase here, originally, we didn't show that. Uh, in the picture, I stuttered. And uh, uh, in this uh, here, I meet a girl and uh, meet her on the train, just... Uh, I don't know, I think that's, uh, I th they don't know where they're going to start. They told me they were going to start this chase, but if they don't, I meet her on the train. That probably is not in here. And uh, the train, she, when she gets off, I say goodbye to her, but I have fallen in love with a girl just at first sight. And later on, I see in the paper where she's going to get married, but she's marrying a bigamist. And I find out that I have one hour to stop this horrible tragedy. So this, I think what you're going to see is purely one of these hectic chases where I'm trying to get there to stop this mean villain from marrying the girl I love. And, uh, of course, we live happily ever after, so you can judge that I got there. But uh, it was a long chase. I don't know whether they, they probably don't have it all in. It was probably one of the longest chases ever put on, uh, on film. But it has quite a bit of action to it. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, before we go on, I think we should give a hand to the lady who has lived happily ever after, Mrs. Harold Lloyd. Harold, I'll tell you, somebody beats the hell out of Ben-Hur. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> they wasted a lot of money. <laughs> Harold, this may sound like an innocuous question. Steve is gonna continue on a little bit about it, but uh, I wanna preface it by saying you had uh, uh, a re-release, didn't you, about a year ago. Financially, it did very well yes, of an early yes. film. Now, taking an early film of this type, how, in your mind or in your taste, does it compare with the comedies of today? Well, Jack, that's hard to say. We have great comedians today. Uh, I can mention one after the other. I won't do it because there's some I'd leave out. We have tremendous. But I think that the, the style of comedy is entirely different today from what it was mm. then. They, uh, I think some of them have wanted to go back and use the pattern we did, but I think they've kind of lost it. They've got to have uh, the right kind of what we call gag men, idea men, uh, the right kind of directors that knew how to do it. And then with the facilities they have today with dialogue, it is just an easier process to go along and do it the way they're doing it now. It's much more expensive to do it uh, to a degree. And today, I shudder to think what the cost would be to take the time to, <laughs> to do it with the, the, the way the dollar has gone up. Mm. But it's just two different uh, schools of thought in comedy. That's all I'd say, yeah. Jack. Uh, sometimes on television, uh, Harold, I have to become involved in stunts which are physically dangerous, but uh, my stunts are very small potatoes compared to the things we've just seen here. Steve, let me interject. I think you come about as close to coming well, back to as anybody I know, really. I come as close as you can come and still remain living. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, well, the re I, don't, I don't want to talk about myself, but the reason I bring up that point is that I understand that you uh, uh, very rarely used a stuntman. Certain people connected with the production wanted you to, but suddenly uh, you'd find yourself involved with the thing and you'd say, well, I'll go ahead and try it myself, and that's the way it would work out. Is that true? Yes, well, about the only time I uh, do it, there's a lot of things I couldn't do that I wasn't equipped to do. So when I did that, I got a stuntman. The things that I could, it's very funny, I can exemplify it by a picture I came back and did with Preston Sturgis. I didn't like the picture very well. Parts of it were very good. Uh, but in it, uh, there was a stunt where I had to uh, uh, be suspended from the neck of a lion with this chain running down to my foot, and they had two stuntmen. And uh, because I said I'd gone along a little too far, a number of years later, so the stuntman did it, and then Sturgis, who was a very adept talker, said, Harold, you go up into the camera and they don't do it like you do. So he talked me into doing it. So I did that and it went on that way till no matter how many stunts the stuntmen did, they did them first, then I did them and there wasn't one <laughs> scene of the stuntmen left in that whole picture. <laughs> but uh, in that particular one, I did have them do it first because swinging back along the ledges of these buildings, you could get quite a crack, you know, hitting the corners of windows and things like that. And we actually didn't, but that one, it was supposed to be up on the side of a building, and that one we actually did in a studio with a form, uh, a trick form of, uh, of photography. And when we did them in the early days, we didn't have any uh, trick photography, certainly no process. And uh, in those days, when w it looked like we were eight stories or 12 stories in the air, we were actually that high. We did them that way. And the only protection that we really had was that we had built a large platform below me. But it was a long ways up, 10 or 20, uh, 15, 20 feet. And we piled mattresses, no railings, because they would make us lower the platform. But uh, we, uh, they, I think they looked better then, because they beat process a little. Mm. People were there when we shot them there. <laughs> we hear so much these days about uh, the word violence in connection with television. It just hit me while looking at that sequence, uh, Harold, that uh, people can stand a heck of a lot of violence as long as it's in a comedy. Yes, I'll tell you, the, one of the main things that we did in those days was that when you had a fall, which we had many of them, and when you got hit with something, you, you never showed pain. Mm -hmm. If you showed pain, that took the comedy out of it. Yeah, good point. Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in closing our interview with Harold, uh, I want to add this note that I think most of you know, but some may not, that he didn't stop giving joy to the world when he finished making pictures. As Imperial Potentate of the Shriner, he was the leading spirit in creating the crippled, uh, the, uh, the hospital for the crippled, crippled children of this nation, and went on in that regard throughout the rest of his career as an imperial potentate of the Shriners, so he deserves our thanks for that, too. Thank you.